Well, I think I say we did two years. We did it because we could go back to the very early life for many years in this early uh, to honor psychology and law uh, contribution, uh, distinguished contributions award these. And uh, I think the turnout at, at this hour is kind of a, an indicator of, of how important these two people have been uh, for all of us. And I welcome you and uh, I'll tell you what we're going to do. There are two awardees this year, therefore um, they have uh, collaborated in the best tradition of psychology and law to put together two presentations, but one flows from the other. So. Um, the way that uh, we decided we ought to do this is for me to go ahead and introduce an award. Um, and let him do his presentation, and then uh, in the middle of the, uh, the other awardee. So that's where we're going. And uh, welcome, and uh, I hope you're all having uh, a great time. The first awardee this year is Kirk Howard. He's, uh, as you all know, professor and uh, is currently interim head of psychology at Drexel. Um, Kirk has um, a, a really distinguished uh, repertoire of articles and, and books, uh, over 125 peer-reviewed articles, um, edited, co-edited, authored, or co-authored uh, 11 books. Um, I think my favorites are his first and his most recent. Uh, the first was uh, Principles of Forensic Mental Health Assessment uh, in 2001, which now I consider to be a classic, uh, probably exciting more than anything else uh, during the writing. And the most recent one um, is Spectacular, uh, APA Handbook of Psychology and Juvenile Justice, uh, which he edited and is uh, just a, a, a wonderful of where we're at uh, currently in the digital justice. Now, a lot of us, when we get to this stage in our career, have a lot of publications. That's not why uh, we get awards. Uh, th this award is to Kirk because of what he's done with them uh, and, and what they've done uh, to the field. Uh, I think Kirk is best characterized as a translator. Uh, he translates uh, theory and and empirical work for the forensic clinicians. And he translates back as well. Here's what's going on with the forensic clinicians. Here's what they need. Please, researchers, do something about it. And it's this, it's this, it's this key role that he's played for so many years as a, uh, as a translator for us, both in law and psychology, scholarship and clinical practice, in the area of uh, education and training, uh, empirical and experiential. And there are many, many students, some of them in this room, I'm sure, uh, who've gone on to uh, uh, distinguished careers uh, because of their work with Kirk. The other thing is, it, it, it's very far reaching in scope. Uh, you look at uh, the body of work that Kirk has done it's adult and juvenile, it's criminal and civil, it's um, assessment and treatment, it's just the breadth is uh, spectacular. And that's how he's made his uh, significant impact. You look at people's CV, sometimes things pop up that you hadn't noticed before. Like, Kirk does, has had a lot of points in his career where he's been doing two big things at once. Uh, I first noticed this when I looked and saw that when, when, when was he president of APLS? Oh, that was 1996. But it's also the year he was president of ABFP. Uh, and and I, there were several examples of that as it went through. Uh, during 2005-2012, he was associate editor of Law and Human Behavior, but he was also co-editing uh, that Oxford University series that uh, he and Alan Goldstein uh, and I worked on. Uh, he's, uh, his list of consultations to federal and state um, and advocacy groups is extensive. Uh, he's been, uh, assisting on amicus briefs for cases like Panetti v. Quarterman. Um, I don't know of very many people uh, who have so thoroughly spanned uh, the research and, and clinical sides of psychology and law, and I think that's primarily why he is being awarded 
uh, this award today. Also, he's a pretty good racquetball player. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, Kirk, uh, come up here, and uh, we're delighted to uh, recognize you for, this, uh, for your outstanding contributions. Uh, join me in. Thank you again for coming out this morning. I know it's early that some of you were up late singing and doing other stuff, so <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's always a pleasure. I have to say that uh, one of the things that, uh, that has really struck me over the years, and the first thing I want to do is, is thank some special people, but the, the first thing I'd like to do is, is acknowledge how important it is for me to think about this honor coming from this organization. I've been coming to APLS since 1979, and it's been the single home for me in this field over the years. It's been the most congenial, collaborative, supportive, and yet critical thinking organization that I've ever been a part of. So it is, it's truly an honor in, in many, many important ways for me, and I, I thank you so much for this. Uh, let me start by uh, thanking a few people in particular. I'd like to start with uh, Patty and Anna and my new son-in-law, Chris, of course, who make my life much, much, much better than it would be otherwise. Uh, it's especially meaningful for me to have Tom Grisso do this introduction because Tom, as much as anyone, has been instrumental in helping me, supporting me, demanding things of me <laughs> over the years. Uh, what Tom didn't say is that perhaps one of the reasons the first book is one of his favorites is that he was my editor. This was published <laughs> with the APLS series long, long after he stepped down doing editing for other books. So uh, Tom and I went back and forth on this so long that in any other context he would have been probably the first author. <laughs> but certainly the second author. And this went from an original sort of a light-hearted New Yorker cartoons, here's a little forensic assessment, to something that really was, it made a difference for me and it has made a difference over the years. And so Tom gets 95% of the credit for that, <laughs> I, I gotta say. Uh, Ron Rash, it was, it was really meaningful for me to have Ron be one of my proposers for this award because Ron has been a giant in this field. Uh, over even more years than I've been involved with it, Ron has shaped it, he has contributed to it, he has mentored graduate students, he has done everything that a, a founding father would do. So, so Ron, uh, I'm very grateful to have you make that nomination and be sitting here today. Uh, Stan Brodsky, I think Stan's working out. He told me he wasn't going to be able to see <laughs> this early. But, uh, but Stan has been another one of those people who've just been so instrumental. Uh, you know, way back when I was just starting and I had a few questions about the field and where I was going, Stan, like he has for many people, was very supportive, very direct. He said, you can do this, just, just get on the horse and ride. And he, also over the years, he's been someone who's been very, very collaborative and supportive. Uh, people like uh, John Monahan over the years. John has been a great model and someone who's always been very gracious about, uh, about helping out. Uh, Ned, Ned, Ned McGargy, my old postdoc uh, supervisor. Uh, Stu Parsons and Sam Cunningham, who gave me my first job at the forensic hospital at, in, in Florida. Hank Stedman and Salim Shah, who were already established leaders of the field when I was coming along. Norm Poitras, who was a fellow graduate student and a, a friend and who wrote the seminal article, a proposal for training in forensic psychology, uh, which appeared in the American Psychologist at a time when I was looking at this field and it just reassured me that there is a there there. And as I look out in this room today, there is obviously a there there. But it, back in the 1970s, we were still struggling with that a little bit. Uh, my, uh, my ABFP colleagues, Alan Goldstein, Randy Otto, Ira Packer, Diane Fallingstadt, Steve Golding, Mary Alice Conroy, Matt Zychek, uh, we did some great work and it was a, a real pleasure working with all of you. When Patty and I moved to Virginia from Florida, we had the chance to, to meet personally and work with people that we'd only 
heard about and read about, the Richard Bonnies and the Dick Repucci's, Janet Warren and Jen Woolard and Dan Murray, and we found out that they were actually as good as people have been saying they were. Uh, then we moved to Philadelphia in 1995, and my Drexel colleagues, Don Bursoff, who I moved there to work with, and subsequently Naomi Goldstein and Dave DiMatteo, and many, many graduate students over the years. Uh, too many to name, but many of you are sitting out here, and you got up at 8 a.m., so thank you very much for that. Uh, it's been a, a, a privilege working with you over the years. Uh, Ed Mulvey and Carol Schubert are, are colleagues from Western Psychiatric who collaborate with us on a center of excellence in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, Edie Green, who's my co-author on uh, Reitzman Psychology in the Legal System, and I should probably say Larry Reitzman too because we kept his name on the book. Uh, Jim Ogloff, who uh, people may have noticed that Jim is actually here after a number of years, and uh, if you ever have the chance to go to Australia, Jim will be your gracious host and he will take you to an Aussie Rules football game, which you will spend at least half the first game figuring out what the hell is going on. <laughs> but once you do, I can assure you it's a great game. Uh, Marnie Rice and Grant Harris, two risk researchers who left us too early. Uh, Chris Slobogan, John Petrilla, and Michael Perlin, who are the, the, the finest psycholegal scholars and have been gracious enough over the years to contribute many of their efforts to what we've been doing here. And Chris is going to be honored, and you'll hear from him in just a minute. Been fortunate in Philadelphia to be uh, in the place where the Juvenile Law Center operates. So, uh, Marsha Levick and Bob Schwartz have been great people to work with over the years. My, uh, my old LHB crew, uh, Brian Cutler, who was editor, and Patty Zaff and Margaret Bulcovera, who were uh, associate editors along with me. And then, of course, Patty has gone on to be such a great uh, APLS president, uh, as, did, as did Brian. Those were great years, and I really enjoyed working with all of you. Uh, and and uh, Dick Rogers, who I've established this kind of emerging tradition of meeting in the hall at APLS and kind of catching up for five or ten minutes, and then we continue along our way. And then there's sort of the next generation, and, and by this I mean people who are came along a little bit after me, but who have now uh, established themselves and really guided the field for many years. The the Jen Schemes and Steve Hartz and. Kevin Douglas, Eric Elbogen, and Barry Rosenfeld, and Karen Salakin, and Gina Vincent, and Mario Scalora, and Randy Salakin. There are many more, and it's, it's really been my privilege to work with you all over the years. Uh, I, I thank you for <coughs> everything that you have done on my behalf, and I, let me just say that when I was starting out, uh, people were always, these people and others were always kind enough to uh, back in those days, there were no email, but they would answer a phone call, they would talk to me in the hall, uh, things like that. And what I remember is that they were so good that I was never going to not answer an email or a phone call or have a conversation with somebody, and I've tried to make that an ironclad rule. I've never not done that, and I would ask on behalf of this organization that you all carry that forward because it's a, a great tradition and it makes people feel very welcome when they come in. So you get something like this and you're tempted to say, how can I summarize every important thing I've ever done mm -hmm. in this field in 20 minutes? I thought about that, unfortunately, I think I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> At least what I can do is talk about something that has really been fascinating to me for a lot of my career, and that is structure. Uh, structure as, as it relates to clinical judgment, as it relates to research, as it relates to policy. And in thinking about structure, the question is not whether it's important. I mean, that was pretty much settled in my mind by Paul Meal in the 1950s when he wrote his little book. But the, the question really is how to apply it, what to apply and how. And so I've always been fascinated by things like the specialty guidelines in two editions and the, the principles that Tom and I worked on uh, a forensic mental health assessment, the National Research Council report, which Steph Brooks Holliday and I wrote an article on that they're strengthening forensic science in the US, the Oxford series, which Tom alluded to that, uh, that he and Alan Goldstein and I edited. Those are all things where you were able to take what the field has established or is emerging in terms of science and put them into a form that is, I'd never thought of myself as translational, but when Tom used that, that word, I, I think it does apply to my interests a lot. How do you go from science to practice? How do you go from science to policy and that kind of thing? So 
Uh, given that, uh, one of the things that I thought I might talk about today in conjunction with Chris, since Chris uh, recently chaired the Revisions Committee of the American Bar Association Criminal Justice Mental Health Standards, and I had the privilege of being, along with Randy Otto, one of the two psychologists who was also on that Revisions Committee. So uh, it, what I thought I might do is talk a little bit about those uh, standards and other sorts of structure as an example. Now, I, I have worked uh, with two of my graduate students <coughs> as part of this process because I had this idea that now, I, I have this memory of Salim Shah many, many years ago lugging around a stack of brown books and giving them away for free. I guess that's a little redundant there, isn't it? Y giving them away and saying, this is important, you need to read this. And Salim was a good guy, I wanted to be polite, so I took it and said, sure. And then it was the first version of the criminal justice mental health standards. And actually, it was very good stuff and it's something that the field has largely ignored, our field, and it should not have. Salim knew that back then, and <clears throat> one of the, the points that Chris and I, one of the underlying points uh, that we want to make today is, please pay more attention to this one. And, and I know in part that the field ignored them because I've worked with a couple of my graduate students, Sarah Phillips and Alice Thornwell, on kind of documenting how often those standards and some other standards and sources of authorities get cited. And we've got something coming out in professional psychology uh, fairly soon, and it's going to show that the EPPCC, the ethics code, gets cited a fair amount. The specialty guidelines get cited some. The criminal justice mental health standards are almost never cited. Now, you can say, well, that's citation. That doesn't mean that people aren't out there using it and so on. And you'd have a point. But on the other hand, uh, we, we think that where there's smoke, there's fire, and vice versa. So what I'm going to suggest to you is I'm going to give you in a few minutes my top 10 reasons why I think we ought to, as a field, be increasingly interested in structure and ways of translating what the science has been able to show into what our policy and practice ought to be. Uh, so. Here we have it to begin with. The first important reason is historical, that you can get a good sense, a pretty good sense of what was going on in the field back in the 1980s and early 90s uh, if you look at the earlier version of the specialty guidelines, for instance, and look at today's version. So last night I, I was talking with Tom and Steve Golding and I have this vivid memory of the first time they ever introduced the first draft of the specialty guidelines, which was in Miami in 1988, and they were standing up on the stage and it was a huge room. And you'd think reading the, the specialty guidelines, that's pretty benign stuff. I mean, what's to get upset about? People were screaming at them. They were screaming at them. And Tom, being Tom, was being reasonable and talking them through it. And Golding, being Golding, was screaming back mm. at them. <laughs> and I, I had this memory, but I didn't remember why they were screaming until Tom supplied that bit of information last night, which is a lot of private practitioners in the room looking at the specialty guidelines saying, this is cutting into my business. If we do this, we won't get referrals in the same way. So what we now take for granted as being in the specialty guidelines for many years, history tells us that people were not at all happy about it back in the 80s when it was being introduced. So some of the other changes from first to second edition that Randy summarized for me. Uh, the second edition uses aspirational language. Whenever something is not mandated by the ethics code, it devotes more attention to informed consent. It expands beyond criminal evaluations, and it does not refer to examinees as clients. So both the backstory and the, the black letter print in both gives you a better sense of history. It's probably not any sort of news flash to people in this room that you're more accurate if you use structure. Apparently, the, uh, the medical profession, judging by the checklist manifesto, was uh, uh, was a bit more surprised by that. I mean, that, that we take that almost as an item of faith. It's been supported so often. Uh, but in promoting accuracy, one of the things that we want to pay attention to is what we're actually promoting and to take new and emerging stuff and combine that with existing kind of 
standards and evidence trends and so on is a challenging thing. We have done that some in some of our, our standards and guidelines and so on. As a, as a field, we could really stand to do it more, I think, for some reasons I'm going to mention in just a minute. Uh, so not only does it promote accuracy in decision making and so on, but it also promotes substance and uniformity. As, as a field in psychology, we're a bit more on the we want to do it our way and we've got individual and creative needs and so on as contrasted, say, with law or medicine, which just say do it this way or we're not going to, you know, <laughs> here's the consequence, we don't care if it sounds coercive. So that's, that's fine, that's something I've always liked about psychology, but, we, but I, I think my point here is that we can, uh, we can be a bit creative while still uh, promoting substance and, and some uniformity, which as researchers we recognize is going to reduce the error variance. Uh, <clears throat> it informs research and scholarly questions. Uh, for those of you who have not yet seen this, and that's probably most of you because it's still in draft form, Chris tells me that if all goes well, this will be approved by the end of the summer by the ABA. But once you get the chance to look at this, I defy you, I defy you to read through this and not come up with three, four, five, or six ideas for your practice, for your policy, or for a research, future research project. It is just really good stuff. And it was a real privilege for me to sit in the room with people who were good at a lot of different areas, listen to their perspectives, listen to their reasoning, and that gets reflected in these standards. Along those lines, uh, it is if you really want to talk about true interdisciplinary collaboration, then work with people not only across disciplinary lines, but across prosecutor versus defense attorney versus plaintiff's attorney versus judicial lines. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I had the privilege of doing uh, under Chris's guidance in this, ref uh, in this updating process, uh, it was really valuable. And we have a vignette, which we hope to get to at the end of the day, and vignettes are particularly valuable, I've found, for this sort of interdisciplinary uh, discussion back and forth. These standards embodies the law, embody the law's value for precedent and, uh, and so on. Uh, our own standards embody psychology's value for ethical standards. And one of the things that I think is most useful about a document like this, like the criminal justice mental health standards, that Chris is about to talk about in more detail is you really get a sense of where the field stands having been vetted at a number of different levels. And don't think that these don't reflect some of our own guidelines, our own specialty guidelines and ethics codes and so on, as well as psychiatry's because there were psychiatry representatives on the committee as well. Um, there's a lot of bad law out there. I'm from Pennsylvania, and we uh, lead the nation in bad law in a lot of ways. We have something called the Mental Health Procedures Act that I wish I could pick up wholesale and dump in the river and rewrite entirely. Uh, if you read through as a lawmaker these criminal justice mental health standards, you could do a much better job in an afternoon than, th than that piece of law in Pennsylvania has done over 40 years. So it does promote good <laughs> legislation. Um, we did have one judge, Steve Leifman, many of you probably know Steve. Uh, he is very strong in getting these standards in front of judges, National Judicial, Judicial College in Reno. I would love to see that because uh, they really reflect a lot of the, the thinking that the field has, uh, has changed somewhat since the 1980s, although I have to say that they were really thinking about things in a forward way in the 1980s because uh, not all of it was was changing. And then finally, um, promoting better services, no, not finally, this is the penultimate, promoting better services to forensic consumers is something that we need to think about, need to do better, and to the extent that we are more accurate in what the science tells us in terms of its applications, what works better in assessment and treatment, we provide better services. And then this is my final one. Um, as a field, we badly underuse technology. We don't even use the technology that we have available to us right now, let alone think about the tasks that we need to develop and how the software, the apps, the hardware needs to follow from that. 
So, but what we do know is that we could take these standards and store them and make them accessible in a way that you don't have to lug those brown books around anymore. You just pull out your phone and it's, uh, uh, it's very valuable in that way, a lot easier than it used to be. So, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Tom now who's going to uh, uh, introduce Chris, but in conclusion, let me just say again, thank you for this honor. Thank you for the privilege of working with you over the years, and I look forward to many more. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, the second uh, Distinguished Contribution Awardee is Chris Lowe. Uh, currently, he is the Milton Underwood Professor of Law at Vanderbilt, and uh, many of us have known him in his earlier position at the University of Florida, uh, the Stephen O'Connell uh, Chair of Law. Uh, once again, uh, uh, Chris has uh, published uh, well over 100 law review and peer reviewed uh, uh, publications, uh, eight books and texts. Uh, his, uh, He's produced groundbreaking uh, legal analyses in quite a number of areas. Again, we have this diversity uh, in the areas of privacy, um, police investigation, forensic mental health assessment, juveniles and preventive justice. And regarding his books, if you're forensic, obviously you know uh, his work with his colleagues, psychological evaluations in the courts. Uh, if you are uh, primarily focused on mental disability law, then minding justice is, uh, is your book. Uh, if you have juvenile interests, juveniles at risk, uh, his most uh, recent one. Uh, Chris has been identified as one of the most uh, influential psycholegal scholars in the past uh, four decades. Uh, he's among the five most cited criminal law and procedure professors between 2009 and 2013, with some indications of the degree of impact uh, that he's had. Um, I went back and looked at his very first publication. Uh, it was with, uh, at least it's the first one in your CV, with Richard Bonney on uh, the, the case for informed speculation. Just don't give the year. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. <laughs> because I just cited it in something I'm writing. <laughs> it's the oldest thing I say. <laughs> I, I wrote it when I was nine years old. <laughs> it's the oldest thing I cited. It still was a value. It, it, it said something that really needed to be identified. <clears throat> Nobody had said it any better since then. Uh, Chris has contributed to uh, numerous um, foundational mental health law standards committees, and as you've already uh, uh, seen, and we'll hear more about, uh, chaired the revisions committee on the ABA criminal justice uh, mental health standards, um, and he'll be talking about that. Uh, formally and informally, uh, Chris has just been an essential ingredient, is the way I think of it. Uh, in uh, an APLS and, and, and in making it what it is. Uh, he was on the editorial board of LHB for 30 years. Um, he's recently led an effort to uh, provide, revive, I'm not quite sure, I did the identity uh, for APLS for young legal scholars. Uh, and uh, something that I remember starting to talk about back in Portland, and now we have symposia and a variety of things that are uh, that are actually doing that. And of course, a key member of the Joel, Chris, and Matt team uh, <laughs> that leads our late night um, sing-alongs at all of our APLS conventions. Uh, and um, that was why he and I were kind of dragging in here. So. <laughs> so in all these ways, he's been one of the key threads, I think, in, in the APLS uh, fabric. Uh, a kind of an indispensable legal substance uh, that blends uh, our science uh, and, and makes the APLS uh, alloy uh, that we call psychology and law, which would be far weaker uh, without Chris. 
So Chris, uh, come forward and uh, we give you this award. And, uh... yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was a fantastic introduction, Tom, um, and now I'm incredibly depressed. He must have <laughs> used the words three decades or four decades several times in an introduction, um, which suggests uh, that I've been around a long time, um, which in many ways is good. The APLS uh, conference is my favorite conference. I go to a lot of conferences. I go to the, the Law Professors Conference every year. I go to Law and Society. I go to criminology conferences. This is my favorite conference. And it's not just because I get this thing with Tom and Matt and Joel. Um, the, the interdisciplinary nature of this conference is fantastic. Uh, I find that the way people think here is uh, very synonymous with the way I think. I think that the law makes all sorts of assumptions about behavior that are totally untested unless you all come along and test them. And I think that's one of your, the great values of this <coughs> conference and the folks in it is that you look at the assertions made by the law and then you test them. Lawyers, on the other hand, just make assertions and they stop there. Those assertions need to be tested. You all are great at doing that. Keep it up. Um, and that's one of the reasons um, when I do presentations here, I try to come up with hypotheses that will um, further the progress that the law and psychology are making together. Um, the other thing I want to point out, uh, and this is very important, is I do have a tie. <laughs> um, but uh, I didn't wear it today because I wore it yesterday. Um, so, uh, but it's no dishonor to this award um, that I'm not wearing one. Um, again, I think it reflects the informality of this conference, which is another reason I like it, is that um, not only uh, do people sometimes wear jeans, but they also sing in the lobby and get kicked out at midnight uh, on a Friday. Um, what is today? Uh, but it, whatever day it is. Okay, um, so um, as Kirk said, we're going to try to flow together here. And so I am going to talk about the ABA standards, which have been in the revision process for some time. And I want to thank, uh, in particular, Kirk and Randy for participating in that process. It started in 2012. So it went, it's gone on for a very long time. Uh, and we're still going through the process of vetting the standards. Um, but we also had a lot of other good people. And before I get into what we did um, in these revisions, I want to give you a little bit of background of the hoops one has to jump through in order to get standards to the ABA. Um, and so I'll begin with the fact that the typical standards process, the standards process that the ABA typically en engages in, um, takes three to four years. Um, now what are standards? They are black letter rules that apply to the legal profession. Sometimes they're ignored. Um, they're not always cited uh, prolifically but they do find their way into scholarship, um, even if they're not cited in case law, and they are routinely consulted by lawyers in the profession, defense attorneys, prosecutors, and judges. So their standards are on the grand jury, their standards on discovery, their standards on the right to jury trial, their standards on the prosecution function, the defense function, and their standards on mental health law. The mental health law project I'll talk about in a second, but let me finish telling you about how the typical process goes. You can see here, some reason it's not coming up. Okay, there we go. Um, four stages. We have a task force, which is what Kirk and I served on in the Mental Health Project, um, composed in the way you see here. Then after the task force finishes its job, which usually takes one to two years, it goes to something called the Standards Committee. And the Standards Committee, composed of people you see here, vets it, um, usually over a year-long process, not just face-to-face -face meetings, but via emails and so on. Of course, uh, we didn't use emails in the old days, three or four decades ago, but now we do. <laughs> Um, and then after that, it has to go through another hoop, the Criminal Justice Council, which is a much larger group. And then finally, it goes to the ABA House of Delegates. At any one of these stages, this is the depressing part of it, at any one of these stages, someone can stand up and say, this is, well, I won't use the word. Somebody doesn't like it, and it can bring the whole process to a screeching halt. And we have to go back to the drawing boards. Um, so it's a scary process if you're involved in it or all in it, but it's also a good process because what it does is allows a whole bunch of input from a whole bunch of different people. As Kirk said, interdisciplinary, even within the law, that is, we have prosecutors and defense attorneys and judges, and believe it or not, very often there's consensus reached among all three of those parties. Um, so what about the me mental health standards? Well, actually, they were different in a lot of ways. They followed the same four-stage process, but not just one task force, six task forces six different task forces 
were involved in the mental health standards. It was a huge project, biggest project the ABA has ever undertaken um, because so much was involved. You all know how big mental health law is. The ABA wanted to tackle every single issue in the mental health law field as it intersected with criminal law. So we had all these task forces. Uh, well, I shouldn't say we, even though um, I was nine years old at the time, they did not ask me to be on these task forces. Uh, but there were a lot of very, very good people involved in this process. I'm just going to read some of these names, and it will be depressing if most of you don't recognize these names. It's like when I say Paul McCartney and people think, oh, isn't he one that sings with wings? No, he was a beetle, right, in case you didn't know. Um, and these are the people who were on this project initially. Uh, Bernie Diamond, Lauren Roth, Alan Stone, Carl Menninger, Phil Resnick, Carl Momquist, Murray Levine, John Monahan, Bruce Sales, Hank Steadman, Richard Bonney, Norval Morris, Bruce Ennis, Jim Ellis, Patricia Wool. These are great, great people um, who are really superb advocates for people with mental disability who know a lot about mental health law, and they served on these task forces. And as you can see here, that original uh, group of task forces came up with over 100 black letter standards. It's the biggest set of black letter standards the ABA has ever produced. Uh, commentary, over 500 pages. I was involved in this, but not, um, I, I came in late because I was young. Um, <laughs> and I came in late and I was a uh, reporter, and so I did write some commentary for this. Um, this is uh, what the task forces produced. You can see the subjects that were addressed by the standards, the role of mental health professionals, evaluation issues, uh, the police role with respect to people with mental disability, uh, competency standards, mental state defenses, commitment of insane equities, sentencing special commitment, and prison issues. So those are the issues that were addressed by the original task forces and eventually did get through the House of Delegates. So what happened in 2012 is the ABA decided we need to revise things, these things. They came out in the 1980s. That was a long time ago, back when I was nine, and we had a number of different developments at the Supreme Court level. The Supreme Court alone has decided over a dozen decisions that had to do with the criminal justice mental health standards. And as you all know, tons of research uh, in the psychology area that's relevant to criminal justice issues that we needed to take into account in revising these standards. So there was good reason to do this. Um, and you can see here the makeup of the task force. Now, I want to stress, whereas there were six task forces back in the 1980s, there was only one task force this time around. Um, so we worked very hard, right, Kirk? Uh, we did. And we did work hard, and we spent a lot of time talking to one another, got to know each other uh, well, and I, I will say that it's probably one of the most rewarding experiences I've had in my life uh, because it was truly interdisciplinary. We had prosecutors, judges, and defense attorneys, like we always do at the ABA, but then we also had people like Kirk. Uh, we also had psychiatrists. And it was a very collegial experience, even though we disagreed quite a bit. But uh, ultimately, we uh, uh, came to a consensus on every single issue we dealt with, w w but one, uh, which I might mention later if you really want to know. Uh, it was not a major issue, but every other thing that we talked about, I think we reached consensus yeah, on. Everything. And uh, I think that was an amazing accomplishment. Now, it may be that once it gets out to the real world, people will say, what were they thinking? But nonetheless, we all agreed. And interestingly enough, uh, the Standards Committee um, also has vetted uh, the product that we came up with and has passed it on to the council. Remember that those are the stages in the ABA process. And right now we're in midway through the council process. We've gone through the first reading of the council. The second reading is the end of April. And I'm hoping um, that it gets through there and then it'll go to the House of Delegates in August. Okay, so um, see what I want to do here. I guess I want to do this. I want to spend some time telling you about the standards. There are 110 uh, black letter standards. My guess is when the commentary is written, which it has not yet been, it has not yet been written, the commentary will be about a thousand pages. Luckily, I don't have to do that. Uh, we have, uh, I don't know how many of you know Larry Fitch, uh, but he will be the reporter. He's going to write most of the commentary. Certainly, I will help him with that, but it's his job to get it done. He's getting paid the big bucks, you know, maybe $2,000 um, to do this. And uh, I look forward to that product. Um, but I thought it, it's interesting. I, obviously, I spent years and years on these standards um, and in the weeds dealing with these standards. But this presentation has enabled me to step back. What were we doing? What the hell were we doing for these three years? What were we trying to accomplish? And interestingly enough, um, excuse me, I thought that perhaps we could talk about the standards in terms of these three goals that three different objectives informed what we were trying to do 
with the standards. Ensure fair and humane treatment for people with mental disability. Ensure a reliable adjudication process for people with mental disability and assure protection of the autonomy and dignity of people with mental disability. And I think actually all of the standards we came up with can fit into one of these three categories. Um, and so that's what I want to talk about briefly, just to acquaint you with what we try to do in these standards. And again, as Kirk said, the hope is that in hearing about these standards, if you haven't already looked at them, if you haven't um, looked at that little brown book, you'll look at the new version that comes out hopefully sometime this year if the AAB House of Delegates passes it. And you'll spend a lot of time thinking about ways you can use them, do research relevant to them, and so on. So the first goal, fair and humane treatment. What am I talking about here? I think an overriding goal of these standards was to make sure that the criminal justice system did not mess things up, right? That if a person with mental disability gets engaged or involved with the criminal justice system, that we don't make things worse. So actually a lot of the standards are designed to kick people out as fast as possible, to get them back out of the criminal justice system, if at all possible. And so there are a number of different standards that try to do that, having to do with diversion programs, uh, specialized courts, um, community treatment alternatives. Uh, Judge Leifman was a major advocate for this particular aspect of the standards, and I think we've been very successful in the standards at making clear this should be the first thought that judges, lawyers, and prosecutors have. How can we avoid involving these people in the criminal justice system um, and make sure that they're treated humanely and fairly. Um, a second uh, thing we did in this vein was emphasize the importance of training. As you all know, uh, police are the, the first individuals within the criminal justice system that usually deal with people who have mental disability and they screw things up a lot. Um, they screw things up so badly that two cases have gotten all the way to the Supreme Court about what police have done in terms of mishandling cases involving people with mental disability. And so it's very important to train police to, uh, in the skills that are necessary to deal with these kinds of folks. So for instance, the standards talk about crisis intervention teams, which the old standards didn't talk about at all. Um, as in addition to, uh, for instance, training for defense attorneys. Defense attorneys have sometimes very little clue on how to communicate with people with mental disability. It's very important for purposes of the system that they know how to do that so they can arrange for diversion or treatment through a specialized court and so on. Prosecutors, often their knee-jerk reaction is, these guys are dangerous as hell. Let's do something immediately to confine them. Very bad move in many, many cases. Prosecutors need training on this kind of stuff. Judges, very often, are reluctant to use diversion programs because they're worried, especially if they're elected, which is true in almost every state, they'll look like they're soft on crime. So there needs to be training in that area, and Judge Leifman is gonna be a great advocate on that score. Um, so that's another way in which we try to ensure fair and um, humane treatment. And then we also have specific rules that place limitations on the various actors in the process to make sure that they don't overreact, that they do uh, express empathy with people who have mental disability. So we have several limitations on how the police may deal with people who have mental disability when they confront them. And I'm not going to go into them here uh, because I don't have time. But we do have limitations on, on that. We also are very clear that competence evaluations may only be used to evaluate competence. Many of you know that often these evaluations are used for other purposes. There are other agendas to get sensing information or just to get the person off the street or get him in the hospital. Totally wrong. We make it very clear in the standards that's not appropriate. Um, consistent with Jackson versus Indiana, which many of you know, and consist uh, consistent with Cell, the standards make very clear that if a person is found incompetent, they may only be treated for time sufficient to restore them or figure out they're not restorable. And the standards over and over again emphasize that treatment should be on an outpatient basis not an inpatient basis for obvious reasons. Cell, as you all know, expresses pretty strongly uh, the idea that there should be a right to refuse medication except under limited circumstances for purposes of restoring a person to competency and the standards replicate that. Um, what if a person is found competent and then found insane, what happens then? The standards do allow special commitment procedures for people found insane, but only for people who've been charged with serious offenses. If it's a less serious offense, um, they're diverted out of the system under the standards. Serious offense, it's actually relatively easy to commit these people initially. But then, after a year, we make commitment much harder. 
And again, this is all designed to ensure there's not overcommitment, overtreatment, overdetention of these groups of individuals. Um, and finally, and this is something the original standard said too, I view it as fair and humane treatment to get rid of sexually violent predator statutes. And the standards take a very strong position on that, that these things should be abolished. Okay, what about the second objective? Obviously, this is an important objective. We want reliable processes. And so in every single situation that the standards deal with, we recommend open adversarial proceedings. Even, for instance, when a person is being transferred from prison to a hospital or back from a hospital to prison, which is a very low visibility kind of event. And we don't require as much process there as we do, for instance, in an insanity trial, but we require a process to ensure reliability. Um, obviously, we all know bad things can happen during interrogations. The standards have several provisions dealing with uh, interrogations of people who have mental disability uh, because there's so many false confessions that come out of interrogations involving people with mental disability. We put major obligations on defense attorneys in terms of investigating uh, cases uh, involving people with mental disability and probably most controversially, this one of the vignettes we uh, are proposing, though I guess we're not going to have time to talk about it here, is what happens if a defense attorney suspects his or her client is incompetent? But the prosecutor has offered a very good deal in the case uh, so that your client, if I'm the defense attorney, my client will walk if I accept the plea. But I'm not sure my client's competent. We state in the standards there's an obligation on the part of the defense attorney to raise the competence issue, even if the plea is a, looks like a good one. Why? Partly for reliability reasons. Okay, we want to make sure that, in fact, the, the thing the person's pleading guilty to was actually committed by the person who's pleading guilty to it. And if the person's incompetent, you can't be sure of that. Now, a lot of defense attorneys push back on this. Look, I got a great deal here. My client can walk. You want me to raise a competency issue? Maybe the guy will end up in a hospital for six months when it's a misdemeanor they only spend two days in jail on? That's absolutely right. Uh, we decided, nonetheless, to impose this obligation on the defense attorney. The defense attorney is an officer of the court. It might even be a fraud on the court. If the defense attorney doesn't raise the issue, there's the reliability issue. And also remember, the standards take a very strong position. There ought to be diversion in minor cases. And if you divert the person, this issue never comes up. And if there is an evaluation, it ought to be on an outpatient basis, and treatment ought to be on an outpatient basis. So if all the other standards are abided by, I don't think the conflict that defense attorneys are worried about exists. Um, reliability is also important in terms of figuring out whether a person should be convicted. So the standards endorse mental state defenses you see here, uh, mens rea defenses, in addition to the insane defense, as well as um, mitigation in capital cases. And perhaps most importantly, the standards endorse official ABA policy as well as official APA policy, uh, which you all have endorsed, that there should be an exemption at the death penalty, not only for people with intellectual disability, but also for people with serious mental illness at the time of the offense. And um, as I'll, uh, I'll say more about it in a second, a lot of states are picking up on that idea. Uh, on the other hand, the standards do not endorse a volitional prong to the insane defense. And that's partly for reliability reasons. We think if there is a, an area where clinicians have very little to say, it's about whether an impulse is irresistible. It's just very, very difficult to say anything reliable about that, so we don't endorse that. Um, in terms of evaluations, now this is interesting and maybe a little controversial. Obviously, we want the evaluation process to be reliable. So we recommend that every evaluation, at least it's court initiated or prosecution initi initiated, be recorded. But we reject the plea from defense attorneys to create a right to attorney presence during the evaluation. Because our consensus, and prosecutors on the task force agree with this, the attorneys tend to be disruptive, what do you think? <laughs> they, they tend to be disruptive during the evaluation process. And we want the evaluation process to be smooth. We want the evaluator to be able to get information. And if there's a recording, the attorney can listen to it later. The attorney doesn't have to be there at the time of the evaluation. On the other hand, if the, if the evaluator wants the attorney there, for instance, in a competency evaluation, as Ron Resch and Steve Golden argued years ago, if it's important to see what the relationship is between the client and the attorney, sure, then it's OK. Or if the attorney will help relax the defendant, then yes, presence of the attorney. But that's up to the evaluator, not up to the attorneys, not up to the Constitution. Um, and the next point, with respect to reliability, to make sure as much as possible, that the defendant feels comfortable talking to the evaluator. The standards express very strongly that the results of an evaluation should only be used to address competency or to address an issue the defense itself decides to raise, like the insane defense. Which means what? The evaluator can tell the defendant right up front, 
This will not be used to adjudicate your guilt unless you and your attorney decide to use it. Unfortunately, that's not the rule that exists in a lot of states, and I think that's a big mistake. It's based on the Fifth Amendment, it's just based on good policy, too. It's based on the idea we need these evaluations to be reliable. And if you can assure the defendant that they pretty much control the results of the evaluation, hopefully that will maximize and optimize what you get from the evaluation. Um, in terms of testimony, uh, we have some provisions having to do with qualifications. Um, this last thing I want to mention briefly, a lot of courts have very strange limitations on what experts can talk about. A lot of courts say, oh, the expert can give his or her opinion, but it's not allowed to explain the basis of that opinion. Why? Because maybe the basis is hearsay uh, or some other type of evidence that the courts view as inadmissible. Now, the Confrontation Clause of the Constitution does prevent description of some facts, but what the standards say is, unless the prejudicial impact of the facts substantially outweigh the probative value of the facts, the evaluator ought to be able to explain his or her opinion. We take a very strong stance on that. Um, and since I'm running out of time, I just want to get to this last uh, aspect of the standards. So this is the third goal that we're trying to achieve. Um, and it obviously it overlaps with the first one to a fairly significant extent. That is, we want to promote the autonomy and dignity of people with mental disability. So what we say in the standards is that people with mental disability should have the same rights as anybody else, so long as they're competent. But of course, that's a $64 million question. What is competence? Very difficult question. I have to say, um, here are the standards sort of finesse it. Uh, we don't say anything other than the Dusky test ought to apply in terms of figuring out whether someone's competent. Now, the commentary, which Larry's going to write, will say a whole lot about what competence means. But in the standards itself, we did not get into the weeds about what competence might mean. On the other hand, if a person is competent, we take the position, and it's a fairly standard one, that the defendant controls pleading guilty, the decision about waiving jury, whether to testify, whether to appeal, and the decision about whether to waive counsel, even if it's against the attorney's advice, which it always will be if the person is waiving counsel, right? <laughs> um, we also take the position that the defendant controls the decision about the insane defense. Okay, not the defense attorney, which is actually the case in many jurisdictions, the defense attorney who's competent controls whether or not the insane defense will be raised. Because it's such a fundamental decision, it says so much about the self-concept of the individual that it ought to be the defendant's decision. On the other hand, um, we actually leave to the attorney the decision about whether to present a mens rea defense, whether to raise issues at capital sentencing in terms of mitigation, and whether to challenge the death penalty in the first place. Now this goes against the autonomy principle. But we decided as a group, and this is one place where we didn't quite have consensus, but as a group we decided that it was more important that we facilitate the reliability of the process when it comes to mens rea and especially when it comes to capital cases, and that trumps the autonomy premise. Uh, for better or for worse, that's what we decided. And in these latter situations, if the defendant ends up disagreeing with the attorney's decision to challenge the death penalty or present mitigating evidence, there is an out the defendant can fire the attorney. If, remember, if the defendant's competent, he or she can waive the right to counsel, and then that person can represent themselves. However, um, consistent with the Edwards case, these standards do say that even if you're competent to waive counsel, you're not competent to represent yourself. You're not allowed to represent yourself if you lack the capacity to carry out the minimum tasks required for self-representation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can see that's basically the Edwards decision. So, like Kirk did, what do we hope will happen with these standards? We're hoping Judge Leifman goes out there and crusades for them. I teach at the National Judicial College as well, um, and we'll be presenting this to, to judges. Um, we are going to make sure it gets in front of attorneys. Right now, we're doing a series of roundtables all over the country, Chicago, Atlanta, uh, San Francisco, New York, with prosecutors, defense attorneys, and judges. We've already done three of them. Got another one coming up next week. And it's making attorneys think hard about the ethical issues that these standards raise. Um, uh, we are getting policymakers to look at various kinds of issues, including the exemption from the death penalty that I mentioned earlier. Several states now have uh, that proposal, in front, several state legislatures have that proposal in front of them. We're going to have scholarship devoted to the standards, including the Hastings Constitutional Law Quarterly. Um, we're hoping you all will do research that, is in, that Kurt's already talked about. Um, and we probably don't have time to do this, but we were hoping that uh, we could get you to talk about a vignette, one of the three vignettes that were. Um, talking about in these roundtables with attorneys. So thanks very much. <laughs> do you want to do it? Do we have time? Well, why don't we see if there are questions, and if they're not, yeah. then we can talk about it. This the is the vignette, you can read it, uh, but we'll take any questions you got. 
questions? Or either or both? Yeah, great. Is the proposal available um, just to look at? I can send it out. I mean, it's not officially ABA policy unless and until the House of Delegates passes it. But I've been, we've been sending it out to all these attorneys that are uh, participating in the roundtables. So I guess it's okay to send it out to you all if you're interested. It's not authoritative. No, what I don't want you to do is read it and say, this is crap, uh, don't do it. Because <laughs> we're too far along in the process and I uh, don't want to um, upset the apple cart. But yeah, I, I, any gentle feedback would be appreciated. Um, <clears throat> we can talk, well. I have a quick question. First of all, thank you so much and congratulations for your awards. Um, thank you. Um, so when you said about the obligation to raise the competency issue and now that there's a push for diverting individuals, I find that attorneys are okay raising the competency issue if they're going to work out the agreement, but if there's going to be a plea to diversion, which is what's happening now, especially mm -hmm. for felony cases, they will say, say things like, well, the person is going to treatment anyways, right? They're pleading and then going to treatment. Is there any mention on how attorneys should be raising the issue of competency, even if the case is going to get diverted? Even if the case is going to get diverted, yeah. The problem that, if I were arguing in favor of our standard, the problem with taking a plea, even if you're going to be diverted, is it goes on your record. Right? And defense attorneys know this, but often they're in the moment. So, oh, good, I can get my client back on the streets or back in treatment, whatever, and all I have to do is agree to this plea. But that is on your record. It can affect employment prospects. It can affect um, other aspects of civil life. It can also lead to a sense enhancement later on down the road. And you know if the person doesn't get good treatment, which sometimes happens, they're probably going to be right back in again for a similar kind of crime. And slowly but surely, things start steamrolling, and the person's in a much worse position. So that's another one of the practical reasons why we say the defense attorney should raise the competence issue. Um, on the other hand, if all things considered, it's the only way you're going to get treatment for the individual and the person really needs it. Um, it's better than not taking the plea, going through the trial process, and... Um, well, you could take a plea, then go to a hospital, get restored, and then, uh, you know... Well, if you take the plea, you're not going to go to a hospital. You yeah. can be found unfed, go to a hospital, get restored, come back, and then take a plea to diversion, which is what we have been advocating. Okay, the well, that's, we, that's what the standards say, too. Okay. Yes, that's what, that's what I was trying to say earlier, if I didn't make it clear. That's what the standards recommend. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what you think. We've had an issue recently where kids with developmental disabilities are getting sentenced. The competency issue isn't being raised, but they can't meaningfully participate in treatment, and so they can't get out of the detention center until they have completed whatever completed treatment. What, what does meaningfully participate in treatment mean? That sounds um, almost like an oxymoron. What does that mean? <clears throat> they can't engage in any treatment. They can't communicate. They can't, they can't engage. It's a, a sex offender protocol and they can't engage and complete the treatment program because they cannot participate in the requirements of the treatment program. Right. And so they can't get out of the camp. And this is a person who's found incompetent. They weren't competent because she wasn't paid. Oh. So, okay. So I'm just curious, I mean, this sounds interesting. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> um, I'm curious how this happens, why it happens. Is this meant to be a diversion program of some sort? Um, in any event, I, my, my, I don't know what you think, Kirk. I mean, my intuition is this probably shouldn't be happening that way. But <clears throat> Yeah, it, it sounds like there's a, a mismatch between the, what you're asking kids to participate in and what's being provided. And that, that looks like it's more the, the issue sort of at that level in that facility and the kinds of stuff that's being provided r rather than the, the larger legal issue about can't meaningfully engage. That, that sounds, in other words, somewhat more like a clinical than a, a legal question to me. There's a little bit of both who is encouraged to plead guilty. I don't know the legal. Oh, so we did plead guilty. Oh. oh, okay. Well, that makes a difference. Right. And then, um, and, and interestingly, then after the plea happened, then competency was raised because the clinicians were saying we can't. I see. Competent to oh. go through the treatment process. I actually. That's an interesting issue. The standards actually don't deal with that. Competency to consent to treatment or competency to participate in treatment. I mean, I know that's important for treaters, for therapists. It's important to make sure there's some kind of uh, understanding on the part of the person being treated. I have a very hard time that a person who's charged with a sex offense, unless there's also an insane defense based uh, on top of it, is incompetent in that sense. 
Um, but if that's true, then that's an issue that does need to be addressed. Um, I think, though, that you can, can, you can treat someone who's not competent. Uh, even though ethically you might not want to, it's permissible under the law to do so if that's part of the court order. Yeah. Um, one of the big issues going on right now is uh, taking a special, special look at 18 to 21 year olds. Uh, not necessarily to, some people say, extend the age to the age, but others are saying just something special. Something special. I, I'm, not, I'm scared of that word, something yeah. special. Yeah. <laughs> do something different with the 18 to 20 year olds than you would do with other adult criminals. Is there anything here that addresses? We deal entirely with adults in these standards, um, and so that's what I meant. yeah, yeah, They're 18 to 20. yeah. No, okay, I'm, yes. Um, so we don't deal, I don't think, with anything along those lines. Um, I have some opinions about that. I think oh, yeah. there ought to be special treatment up to age 25 at least. But in any event, the standards themselves do not specifically single out certain age groups for certain kinds of treatment. Yes, the, the issue of the conferencing one is sticking in my head. Mm -hmm. It's been presented as kind of, look, we're looking at reliability and truth versus kind of a practical approach by defense counsel. But we're really also butting heads with the issue of zealous advocacy, mm -hmm. which is also the defense attorney's job. Uh, is that some of the pushback that you were getting on this issue? Yeah, yes. And it's, it's more than just like a practical issue. Right. right. And to make it really hard on us, what if the defendant is objecting? to having the competency issue raised. That really brings to the fore the tension you're talking about, right? Because the, client, the defense is supposed to do what the client wants. Right. On the other hand, the client may be incompetent, so how much weight do you give to a client's objection to have the competency motion made? It's a very difficult issue. That's why I mentioned it. That's why it's one of our vignettes, because we get very robust discussions about that issue. So there's definitely a tension there. We recognize it and we resolve it in the way we talked about for the reasons I talked about. But there is a big if there. If competency evaluations are not done on an outpatient basis, if treatment's not done on an outpatient basis, if there isn't a very strong preference for diversion in the first place, then I think you've got major problems. And if I were a defense attorney in a regime like that, I probably would not follow the standards. I would take the plea. <clears throat> Thank you. And, uh, oh. Thank you.